Think Tank is a startup company uh, was launched in May 2012. We have offices in Los Angeles, that's where our headquarters is, but we also have an office in New York City. We have engineers and um, uh, employees around the globe in, in uh, working out of their home offices in various countries where we are actually trying to enter the market, so it's a very distributed team. The CEF technology itself uh, is much older than the company. It was actually produced originally in 2003 by Sage Weil, who is now our CTO. He laid the foundation for this technology in his PhD thesis. The thesis was actually based on a Trilabs grant and, and sponsored because it was recognized that the traditional file systems such as um, uh, the Luster file system have limitations and they wanted to do something about that. And it has grown and, and has become something slightly different, um, but very exciting technology. In 2006, Sage decided to make this open source, which means that uh, you can all go download this uh, software, play with it, install it, and start using it. Since 2009, it is actually embedded in the Linux kernel. So if you are Linux users, if you are, if you are a Linux shop in your IT organization, uh, there's a good chance that you have some part of this technology already. Our business model uh, is that we try to emulate a little bit what you would know from Cloudera or Red Hat, which is that we have um, uh, enterprise subscriptions for the software. So Excuse me? Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, very good. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so our business model is that we offer enterprise subscriptions. That means if you deploy this technology in a data center for mission critical applications, most likely you want somebody who is on call at two o'clock in the morning if something goes wrong. Very similar to Red Hat Plus, for example. We also have um, consulting offers and training for the same technology. Good, so basically our mission is to commercialize CEF and actually liberate the businesses, the users of the technology from the expensive and restrictive technologies that they have used in the past. And our value proposition is that we offer enterprise-grade services so you can come to us to assist you with the design of multi-petabyte clusters, large-scale deployments, and of course with support services if you should run into any problems. And all of that, since it's open source, and since you will later see that it is very uh, easily scalable and self-managing, you can uh, get this uh, technology at a very low price, which means that you end up with somewhere between one and five cents per gigabyte um, as a, at an all-in cost, which means that includes your data center, the hardware, and the operator cost. <coughs> so this is actually really low and, and uh, very hard to beat because the software itself is free. So why would you care about that? Uh, first of all, it can save your organization money. This is open source technology. You can run your storage suddenly on commodity hardware, whether you are a shop that uses Dell, HP, uh, any, any hardware vendor, you can deploy the storage technology on that platform. If it runs Linux, uh, that, is, that is the software container for it, uh, you can run it. You can also have a very heterogeneous deployment. That means you don't have to keep buying the same hard drives or the same hardware from the same vendor all the time. With what I talked about earlier, these traditional approaches, you have to do that. You, you have no other choice. If Once you bought a NetApp uh, box, you will end up buying more NetApp because you cannot connect it to anything else. You will save time because it is self-managing, as we will learn later. It increases flexibility because you will have multiple uh, ways of accessing your data and it lowers your risk because there's no vendor login. It's all open source. You can see what's going on and has some very nice features. So let's get to the um, architectural overview that I promised to you. Uh, this first slide is what I call the marketing perspective. Um, it's very simple, only a couple of words, um, and it describes how this thing is configured. At the bottom, you see there is the set storage cluster. That red rectangle represents hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of individual drives that are connected, that run in your data center, but that operate as a single logical cluster. 
This is the foundation for the three access paradigms that can sit on top of it. So you can consume that storage capacity through uh, an object-based paradigm. Uh, object-based paradigm is what you know from Amazon, for example. If you use the S3 storage uh, API, that's an object-based approach. Um, that is implemented through a component that we call the set object gateway. You can also expose that storage capacity through a block device, which means that you can expose a virtual disk to your operating system. Basically, it appears as if it was one large uh, uh, data volume, but in reality, it happens to be spread over uh, tens of thousands of disks. Last but not least, we also have the, third, the set file system, which is um, a distributed uh, file system, a traditional approach that we would know that has a hierarchical organization with folders and, and structure, bindings inside of that. So, uh, if you are a Windows user, for example, you would know that hierarchy, that's what uh, a file system would offer to you. And the main thing to take away is that all of these access methods can sit on the same underlying hardware infrastructure, that same hardware cluster. Now, here's the engineering perspective on the same picture. Uh, we recognize most of the components, but it is a little bit more detailed. And uh, you will now see that there's a new thing, the Brados on the left-hand side, which is a library that makes uh, the cluster available if you want to develop your own applications, if you want to consume storage out of a uh, application directly, whether it's a Java, Ruby, or some other uh, development language. Okay, uh, we are going to look into those components a little more in detail, and we are going to start with the lower component, which uh, from the engineering perspective is called RADOS. RADOS stands for Reliable Autonomous Distributed Object Store. So that is the entirety of all these um, storage devices that are linked up, that form a common logical cluster. How does that work? So you, you go and you buy uh, hard drives, and uh, you put all of them somewhere into a, into a rack, and then you go and, and you uh, format them with a traditional file system. In the Unix world, that could be ButterFS, XFS, or EXD4. Those are the file systems that we support. Then of, and on top of that, we have a component that we call OSD, the Object uh, Storage Daemon. That is the piece of software that actually manages this particular storage that is uh, uh, on that disk. And all of these OSDs communicate uh, amongst each other. They do replication so that uh, you have your data uh, properly stored in multiple places, and if you don't lose any data, if one of these hard drives fail. So essentially what you see is just a tiny little uh, snippet out of a large, large pool of, of um, yeah, storage devices, essentially. And you see that there's another component called monitors, and we are going to see later what the monitors do. Um, but basically from a user perspective, all of this appears as if it was one large logical unit. You don't have to worry about the location of your data. You actually wouldn't know where your data is stored. You just hand it over to the cluster, and the cluster makes sure that it gets uh, stored somewhere, that, that it gets replicated, that you don't lose your data, and some other nice uh, quality of service. So these are the two main components in such a cluster. First one is the uh, OSD. Um, you can have tens of thousands of those. On the disk, typically, those are the components that manage the data storage. And they communicate amongst each other. The monitors are important because some entity has to manage the cluster state. So uh, they're also distributed, and it's usually uh, an, an odd number of monitors because if you have a um, outage of components, if you have disks fail, if you have controllers fail, if you have racks fail, then somehow you need to keep keep moving. Like if, you, if you have a, a, a data center the size of, of Facebook, then you will have maybe five, maybe 50 hard drives fail each day. But your entire cluster as a whole 
needs to keep going. So you cannot be down just because some components uh, have failed. And that component could be an entire site. <coughs> so you, have, you, you need to manage that and you need to self-repair. Uh, self if, if, uh, if there was a case where a human being actually needs to flick a switch or something, it's already too late. It needs to be done automatically. At that scale, at the exabyte scale, it must be done by a system that automatically rebalances uh, before a human actually has to interfere. Good. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, Librados already. That is basically a way uh, so that your application can talk directly to a cluster. Um, I have to speed up a little. The Librados gateway allows you to talk to your cluster through a traditional S3 or um, Swift API. So if you have existing software that currently talks to the Amazon uh, storage infrastructure, you can immediately replace it and just change the URL and point to such an implementation. Same API. Okay, I just wanted to show you this one uh, that uh, shows how a virtual machine can actually link to a storage cluster and treat it as a um, virtual disk, basically. And that is done through the Rados Pod device. Very powerful technology. Um, okay. uh, the Ceph file system, the last uh, of the components, um, will at some point in the future uh, expose a, a, a POSIX compliant API and will be production ready. All of the other components at this point are already awesome. This is nearly awesome. <laughs> it's, it's implemented. Uh, and we have users uh, who have it in production, but we do not recommend that you put it into serious uh, mission-critical applications. Most likely that will be the case uh, at some point next year. We are working on that. Good. Why is this unique? Um, the Usually, if you, if you look at a storage cluster, you, you, you must find a way to organize your data. Traditionally, that was done through lookup tables, um, and we have eliminated that. We have come up with a new way of storing and retrieving data, which does not need uh, a table or a lookup mechanism. So traditionally, you had the application, you had some sort of table, and that you would look up, look up where you have the data stored. A little better would be if you use a, a hashing approach where you just come up with different partitions within your storage cluster and you just store your data in one of these uh, uh, partitions uh, through a hash mechanism, a hash function. That has a big disadvantage because every time you reorganize and if you have a fast growing uh, a data set, you always need to reorganize your data. That's also not very good. That's why we came up with a mechanism called CRUSH, that is the Controlled Replication Under Scalable Hashing, which calculates the location. So the client can just compute where the data is stored. That makes it extremely fast, and it takes out an entire hop, an entire interaction, makes this highly performant. So just as, a, as an animation, this is the demo part of the presentation. Uh, you see how an object gets uh, um, taken into, into individual pieces, and those colorful boxes get stored on our um, uh, devices that you can see in the lower part of the slide. And you basically compute on which of the OSDs a piece of data gets stored. And if you do that for the entire data set, you end up with a very nice distribution across the cluster, very nicely balanced. And you can actually see uh, that there's always multiple copies. For each color, there's uh, two copies of the data. We just have a rule here that says we want a, a level two replication. So um, if you lose one of them, you will still have your data. That is configurable. You can have more copies if you like. Okay, uh, I'm running a bit short on time, so I'm going to skip the piece where it shows you how it recovers from outages. Uh, because I wanted to get to these two slides. Um, Ceph is already integrated today with Apache Cloud Stack, which is uh, one of the major um, open source uh, cloud operating systems. So you can consume Ceph right out of the box. It, it can become your storage platform for Apache Cloud Stack. The same is true for OpenStack. If you have any uh, OpenStack deployments, 
you can use Ceph as your backend for storing objects, for storing um, um, data via the block interface uh, in the Cinder API. Um, and you can basically store your virtual machine images in Ceph as well. All of that very flexibly. Um, and uh, anybody who currently deploys OpenStack in large um, uh, environments typically ends up using Ceph. We have uh, very popular um, uh, users. Bloomberg is one of our um, uh, customers here in New York. They, they are doing exactly that. They are deploying OpenStack on top of Ceph. And it's also in the Linux kernel. So uh, we are working with all the major distros, trying to get um, support from them. And I think we have pretty good coverage at this point. Uh, there's only one that is uh, still behind. And the last slides uh, basically give you pointers uh, how you can get involved. You can download the software. You can uh, read very deep. Uh, Chef, you can use um, Puppet to roll it out in a larger scale. Um, we have IRC channels where you can get assistance. And of course, you can always come to Ink Tank if you need more involved in assistance and consulting. And finally, what are we going to do? Uh, we will allow you to build your storage infrastructure just the way Google and Facebook do it. And essentially, uh, on the long run, we are trying to do to storage what Linux did to the operating system. Thank you very much. Questions? No questions? Just can you explain a little bit more um, clearly how this differentiates from using the Amazon cloud? Just how your service fits? Yep. Uh, maybe how you compete? The, the Amazon cloud is something that Amazon sells you as a service. So they host it in their data centers. You consume the storage. Um, so they have massive infrastructure. We don't host anything. We give you software that you can use to deploy it in your own data center so that you can emulate what Amazon gives you in the public cloud. So if you are, let's say, a bank, you would never store uh, data or client information in Amazon's infrastructure. You want to have that within your own uh, data center. So you can use Ceph to do exactly that. You, if you are a... Uh, internet service provider and you want to compete with Amazon, uh, basically beating them in their own game, uh, you can do that too. And we have one big uh, a, a company called DreamHost who does exactly that. They use Ceph and they offer a, co a competitor to Amazon storage service that is cheaper than Amazon. So what's the what's the biggest competitor between Ceph and Um, cluster FS is, as the name already says, a file system. Um, and that is a Red Hat uh, technology, Red Hat acquired uh, cluster. The, the main difference is in the design. It does not um, have this, this approach where you have a shared um, cluster, that, that the red bar that you saw in the diagram, uh, and exposes multiple um, access paradigms. Uh, cluster was mainly for that third use case to be a file system um, and everything else was kind of bolted on. So it's in the design and um, so I can only say as much as uh, users who have used Cluster uh, and, and compared it to Ceph often switch. But, uh, it's, a, it's a valid technology so we don't really see them as a, as a, as a head-on competitor, but we are basically in the same boat, We're competing against the established vendors and the um, old style of doing things, which is uh, putting a big uh, proprietary box. On the replication, do you do any kind of optimization for the backup copy, or do you store every bit replicated and use twice as much storage? That's an excellent question. Um, and the answer is the latter at this point. Um, we do replication, which means that uh, the data gets stored as an exact copy. So if you have three uh, uh, replicas across your cluster, it takes up three times as much space. 
That is okay if you have a medium-sized cluster, let's say a petabyte, it's about okay, but uh, larger deployments, and we had some interest from, uh, from companies who have like 100 times as much, uh, and if you do that, then cost and energy consumption of, of the drives becomes an issue, and it's just too expensive, even for these big guys, to do simple replication. So that's why we now have on the roadmap uh, erasure coding, which basically consumes less storage on the disk, but uh, will give you the same quality uh, of recoverability if your uh, hardware has a problem. What is the level of compression between? Like, um, it will be somewhere between 1.3 and 1.8. Um, that is currently in development. Um, and that's actually something that I should point out. All of this is very transparent. Everybody in the room can potentially participate. We host regular events and, and um, online meetings where our engineers work with a distributed community of people who contribute. And if, if you have a need for a particular feature, and if this is, for example, something that you are interested in, you're always invited to participate, submit blueprints and ideas, and uh, be part of that community. <laughs> There was one more question. No? Okay. No more questions? Thank you very much. Okay.